right, looking at this question, we're going to talk about how you do calculations involving calorimetry. So um, this is an example question, but to give a more uh, general overview of what calorimetry is before doing that question, it's the idea that you want to find how many calories or joules something contains. How much energy does something contain? So um, a traditional but proper calorimeter involves using water to find the answer to that. So they have a combustion chamber in here with pressurized oxygen and the sample, and you burn it or you do whatever reaction here inside this chamber. If the reaction is exothermic, it will release energy from the chamber into the water that surrounds it. And the stirrer keeps it all evenly mixed so that you can get an, ac an accurate measurement of what's going on in there. If the reaction is endothermic, it will suck energy out of the water, causing the water to get colder. And of course, if it's exothermic, it will release energy to the water, causing the water to get warmer. So here's the thing. Suppose you want to find how many calories a Cheeto has, or a peanut, or a Fruit Loop, or whatever, or even a piece of paper. If you want to find how many calories something has, calorie is energy, calorie is Q, and Q equals MC delta T. So if I wanted to do, say, a Fruit Loop, you can find how many calories in a Fruit Loop, yes, and you'd know how much a Fruit Loop weighs, that's not difficult, but the specific heat of a Fruit Loop is a much more difficult Thing to figure out because the specific heat capacity would depend on a lot of factors such as its density, its size, its composition, which is going to vary even from sample to sample, even within the samples. So this is going to be very inconsistent, and the temperature of a burning fruit loop is also going to be inconsistent depending on the size, the density, how much air, what temperature it is, etc., as in like the warmth of the surrounding environment. So we don't want to try to do it directly with the fruit loop. What you do is you put it in here and burn the fruit loop allow it to release the energy to the water, and then run on a particular assumption. We're gonna say, however much energy, whatever you're measuring, in case this example, maybe the Fruit Loop releases, maybe however much energy the Fruit Loop releases, the water must gain. So if the Fruit Loop contains X calories, the water will absorb X calories, however many it is. If the Fruit Loop has a thousand calories, the water absorbs a thousand calories. If the Fruit Loop is one calorie, the fruit water would absorb one calorie. The idea being, we'll use water to figure out how many calories were in the thing that we're measuring. Which means, if we're gonna use water to figure out the number of calories, that means you need the mass of the water, not what you're measuring, the specific capacity of the water, not the fruit loop or whatever you're measuring, and the change in temperature of the water, not the fruit loop or whatever you're measuring. It has to be all the same. So if you wanna find how many calories are absorbed by the water, you got the mass of the water, the specific capacity of the water, and the change in temperature of the water. So here's an example of a problem involving calorimetry. In this case, it's a piece of paper. It could be anything, but okay, a piece of paper is burned inside a calorimeter. Okay, think that one thing that we just looked at a picture of. That's a calorimeter. Um, that calor... So, actually, let me back up and say that means we put a piece of paper in here and we burn it. And burning is exothermic, so that paper is going to release this energy into the water. What that means is, however many calories or joules were in the paper have now been absorbed by the water, so we're going to find the answer using this equation with the mass of the water, specific heat capacity of the water, and changing temperature of the water. So there's Q equals MC delta T. So let's do that. Let's find how much, how much energy was um, released by that piece of paper. Now it's uh, if we want to find Q equals MC delta T, we've got to say Q equals the mass times the specific heat comes to delta T of the water. So the mass of the water is given right there. 2,216 grams of water times, what's the specific heat capacity of water? It's given in your reference charts. 4.184 joules per gram degrees Celsius. Again, that's given in your reference charts. You'll never have to memorize that. And then finally, What's the delta T of water? Okay, let's do a quick little calculation of delta T down here. The water got warmer, rising from 22.6 to 25.8 degrees Celsius. That means the water's temperature um, rose to a higher number, which means delta T is positive, because delta stands for change, T is for temperature. 
So the change in temperature was positive because the temperature rose. As we look at this, we can see that clearly. So uh, let's see, 25.8 degrees Celsius minus 22.6 degrees Celsius equals, uh, let's see, let me check something here. Let me check, some, let's do a quick calculation. Uh, okay. Plus, well, a gain of 3.2 degrees Celsius. It's definitely not negative. Okay, so um, what we're going to say then, this is what goes right here. Now, notice when we do the math, if we're going to times this all out, grams cancel grams, degrees Celsius cancel degrees Celsius, leaving only joules as the answer, and it is on top. So the final answer to this one is, let me check uh, what I have in the reference material, it's 29,670. And that's the number of joules absorbed by the water. Okay, so a um, thing to mention here. That's not what the question was asking. Because if you use the mass of the water, specific capacity of the water, and the um, temperature change of the water, you're getting joules absorbed by the water. But it didn't ask for joules absorbed by the water. It asked for joules absorbed by the reaction. So this is not the answer. So we have to understand that you have the reaction happening inside the water. The reaction was burning paper, so that means it must be releasing energy. But even if you didn't know that, we're going to say if the water, if the paper released energy, the water would have gained energy. So releasing energy means negative, gaining energy means positive. It's opposite sign. So if this, if the water had positive x calorie or joules for the reaction, it must have been the opposite, negative x number of joules. Or even if it was endothermic, it could be the same idea. If it was an endothermic reaction, the energy gained by the reaction would be equal to the energy lost by the water. So if the water, if the reaction gained X number of joules, the water must have lost X number of joules. So whatever it is, it doesn't matter, exothermic or endothermic, it really doesn't matter. It's opposites. It's opposite signs. So if the water gained energy the reaction must have lost energy. Had the water had a negative sign, our answer would have a positive sign. If, our, if the water has this positive sign, that means our answer must have a negative sign. So if that's absorbed by the water, then that means negative 29,670 joules for the reaction. That's my favorite little abbreviation for reaction. Now, the last thing to mention about that is uh, if we're going to be rounding for, if we're going to be um, putting this in scientific notation as we should, because that's way too big a number to just write as regular number, that becomes 2.967 times 10 to the fourth joules. We'll leave the negative sign there. And this is the Q for the reaction. And then we'll leave it at that. And then, uh, yeah, we'll leave it at that for now. All right. That'll do it.